Hi, I'm Sam Fader. Welcome to The Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to The Sarah O'Connell Show. Sam Fader, welcome to The Sarah O'Connell Show. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you for having me. It's really nice to be here. It's a, a pleasure to have you on my show and an honor as well. I'd love to go back to the beginning of your career and talk about how you first got into filmmaking. Is it something you always wanted to do? You know, I, as a teenager, I became politicized around the AIDS crisis. And at that time, I was also taking up photography. And so in high school, I started doing photo essays and they all came back to the political interests I was having. So one of the early photo essays I made was about black and brown gay men who are adopting babies who were born HIV positive and whose mothers had passed. Um, so very early on, race, class, gender, sexuality were really were a part of my storytelling. And of course, you made your directorial debut in 2006 with Boy I Am. Mm. What was the reaction to that like? And what can you tell us about it? If I understand correctly, it followed uh, three trans guys throughout their transition? It followed three trans guys who were figuring out if they wanted to have top surgery or not. Um, and, sur and following someone through their surgery is something I would never do again. I learned a lot by making that film. And... I made that, I chose to do that because it was all that I had seen at the time. And as someone who was trying to understand this on a personal level, you know, um, that was a conversation. I often am working out my personal issues in my, <laughs> in my work. Um, so I, it was the first film I made. So I based a lot of my filmmaking decisions on what I had seen. Um, and then by the time the film was screening, I kind of did a huge 180 on, on my, on my, and on the ethics in, of filmmaking and what kind of stories should and shouldn't be told. Um, anyway, that film was about the emergence of trans men in Dyke's face in New York City in the early 2000s. And a lot, there was a lot of pushback um, where a lot of women were saying that trans men were taking the easy way out. They didn't want to be masculine women. They were trying to access male privilege. It was a really heated and painful conversation where a lot of trans guys felt really shut out and ostracized by the community they had come up in. Um, and I really wanted there to be an open dialogue about it because a lot of people were having this conversation behind closed doors and um, it just, it, it, it was a painful conversation that needed to get airtime. And so I made that film with my friend, Julie Holler, and we mm. went to a lot of the queer film festivals uh, and it was great. We were able to have those conversations. Um, Unfortunately, we're still hearing reverberations of those conversations in feminist circles, in radical feminist trans exclusive circles. Um, Very true. So it, it's still something we have to dispel. And so in 2010, you released a short film called No More Lies, which talked about trans media representation at the time. And obviously, we're going to get to that in a minute. But is that something that kind of stuck with you at the time and is something you've carried on since is something you wanted to readdress in the future in a, in a wider form? I was really offended by the way the mainstream media was framing trans people, especially in those mm. early days and yeah. the way we still see often now. And so that was, that short was made in direct response to that. And just trying, I was playing a character that I abhor, like a really over the top entitled arrogant person Kind of just poking at the trans person they were reporting on um, and showing that uh, there was such a lack of consideration of the experience of the trans person and that there was such a voyeuristic sensationalized permission on on behalf of the interviewee um, so that yes that was sort of the beginning of my creating work around that conversation and then, of course, she collaborated with Kate Bornstein in 2014's Queer and Pleasant Danger, which I, as I said to you before, I love the title of. What was Kate like to work with? Kate was wonderful. You know, she published a memoir that was called A Queer and Pleasant Danger. And right. when I was coming up with the name of the film, she wanted her memoir to say Kate Bornstein is a queer and pleasant danger. But apparently the publisher said she wasn't famous enough to have her name on the cover, <laughs> that it might deter people from buying it. So she said, would you call the film Kate Bornstein as a queer and pleasant danger? So I give her all the credit for that name. Um, the film is not based on her memoir, which a lot of people tend to think it is. The film is a portrait on Kate. And um, it really just kind of gives a sense of the way Kate moves through the world and the people she's in conversation with, or the people who are, that she's closest to. And working with her was delightful. You know, she's brilliant and generous and... Um, she gave me total creative freedom, which was such a gift. 
yeah, I love everything that Kate does and everyone should check out her, her writing and just everything even she tweets and writes about is phenomenal and well worth your time. Now, I, I must ask you, of course, about your, your latest release, Disclosure, uh, for which you are the director and co-producer. Uh, for the uninitiated, for anyone that doesn't know anything about it yet, can you give us a, a brief synopsis of what the documentary is about? Yeah, Disclosure looks at the current rise of trans visibility um, in film and television and asks how we got to this point, uh, what has history taught us about non-trans people and what has this history taught trans people to think about ourselves. And how did the idea first come about? Because obviously you collaborated with Levan Cox on this, who I believe she's an executive producer. Yes, how yeah, long Laverne. Yeah. How long were you working on the documentary and how long did it sort of take to come into fruition? So, you know, there are two documentaries that have always been inspiring to me um, that really changed my relationship to the media. And one was called The Celluloid Closet, which is about the representation of gay and lesbian people in film. And the other is Ethnic Notions by Marlon Riggs, which is about the representation of black people in film. And right. ever since I saw those documentaries, I, I just kept thinking about what would a history for trans people in film look like? So it's something I've been thinking about for a really, really long time. And then you know, 2014 emerges and trans visibility was increasing in mainstream society, was starting to talk about us more than ever before. The tipping and point. It was the tipping point, right? Yeah. And, I was, <laughs> and that was another moment where I was like, what, where are we tipping? What are we tipping to? What are we tipping from? Who's tipping? I just see one person being elevated in the media who I adore. Um, if it's going to be anyone, I'm so grateful it was Laverne because she, you know, I knew she would use her platform for good. But the world I saw around me, the trans people I saw around me were not uh, experiencing a tipping point. You know, trans people are still continue to be disproportionately underemployed, uh, lack access to safe housing and health care. Um, and the violence towards trans women, specifically black trans women, has reached the, the numbers that can constitute an epidemic. It's, it's a real it's real crisis. And so I was really taken back by that framing. And I also knew that, you know, when you look historically as marginalized communities enter the mainstream, backlash ensues. So I was really struggling with this question of, you know, is visibility the only goal? I don't think it is. It's a means to an end. And the mainstream is talking about the trans community like we have, we have arrived. Um, and also in that idea that visibility means arrival, it was also erasing all of the work of the past, all of yeah. the, not only in film and TV, but all the work that activists have done to, it, you know, over many, many decades. So mm -hmm. it was a very ahistorical moment, it felt. It felt there was a lot that was being left out of the story. So I wanted to tell that story. There really is, because people think that trans people have suddenly just popped up in the last couple of years just because they're aware of them. And you know, you can go back 51 years to the Stonewall Uprising and back even further as the documentary obviously shows you. And then thousands of years if you want to get, pick up a history book as well. Yeah. yeah, trans people have been part of the fabric of every society for all time. And, and in Disclosure, you see that Trans people have been part of film making. You know, I've been in front of the camera and most likely behind the camera since the beginning of filmmaking, since the beginning of celluloid. I think one of our, I mean, a, a clip I found that didn't make it into the film was from 1898. That was as early as I found. But in the film, I think we have a clip from 1901. Obviously, the documentary is on Netflix. How soon did Netflix get involved in the production? Were they sort of, did you pitch it to them before you even started making it? Or was it a case that you made the documentary and sold it to Netflix? How did that happen? Right. So I started this film uh, in the summer of 2015 is when I really right. committed to it. And then um, about two years later, I was giving a, a lecture, I guess. I was presenting my research at a film festival and Laverne happened to be there. And that's when Laverne and I met. And so she came on board. And then when she came on board, I reached out to Netflix. I had a connection. I had a friend there that I had met at Sundance a few years before. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I, I actually just reached out to her for some advice. Just, you know, I, I see this. I felt like there's a lot of potential for this film. You know, what did she think about the, the landscape of filmmaking right now? And just kind of to have a casual conversation. And she was like, why don't you come in for a meeting and, and tell my team about this project? So I did. Uh, but then nothing happened out of that. Nothing came out of it. And... Um, so we went on, we finished the film, we raised our own money. It was, I would say, 
probably 70% of this project was raising the money to do it. Wow. Um, we paid everyone in front of and behind the camera and mm -hmm. we prioritized hiring trans people. And when we couldn't hire a trans person, we mentored a trans person and all, everyone, all of our mentors, all of our mentees had um, stipends. So it was a lot of work to raise the money to do this project properly. Um, and then, you know, we had our world premiere at Sundance, which was a dream and it was amazing. And uh, it, it was more than I could have ever hoped for. And then the world stopped. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we were all ready to then travel to all these film festivals that I've always wanted to go to. I've never had the opportunity, you know, we were gonna go to Copenhagen and Greece and Berlin and London and, you know, everywhere. Um, and then um, everything got canceled. So then we had no idea what was gonna happen and we didn't know if we'd have a home. We figured we, you know, the plan is usually if you're not bought before your premiere, mm -hmm. then you, you tour around, you show your film and during those months, your sales agent has, has conversations with buyers and hopefully you make a good deal. So now we, that wasn't gonna happen. So we didn't know what was gonna happen. So that was pretty rough for a couple months. And then in May, actually, it wasn't until May uh, Netflix reached out to us oh, wow. and said they wanted, uh, well, we had been in conversations with them around a different type of deal, mm. um, but it wasn't a great fit. Uh, so we hadn't finalized that. Um, and so in May, they came back and said we would be really love to take this on. Um, and that's how it started. It's incredible. So it was yeah. really quite a quick turnaround from, I guess, like a month before it was even released. Yeah, it's been busy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I bet. And I'm so glad you made it to England today, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and so one thing I love about the documentary is how it puts the current uh, situation in the world into a historical context and where discrimination might have come from and how it's been portrayed um, and projected in different communities as well. I feel, you know, despite this not being how we wanted the film to have its mark on the world in terms of going right to streaming. I do feel so glad and privileged and, and honored to that we can contribute to this conversation, you know, that's happening right now. Um, you know, Disclosure really connects to this moment and, you know, because the social uprising that we're seeing is about a community that has been systemically oppressed, right, by those with power and privilege and trans people, especially black and brown trans people know this experience so intimately. And you know, through the film, you see how disclosure underscores how patriarchy, white supremacy, settler colonialism, capitalism, how they all further oppress our most marginalized. So it is in direct dialogue with the uprising we're seeing. There's so many amazing trans people in the documentary as well. Can you tell me how, how long you spent filming them and how easy it was to get all these people together? Did you travel to where they were? Did they fly into where you are? How did that all work? I wanted the aesthetic of the interviews to be consistent because the archival footage was going to you know, span a century. So, you know, everything that was going to be a lot of visual information uh, to take in and different types, right. In terms of going, you know, just, I don't need to go into the details of that, but you understand like how, you know, the archival footage is a lot of information. So I wanted the interviews to be consistent. And so we did design a set where we interviewed everyone and we, we brought people here to LA to do it. Um, that is a little bit more expensive than going to people's homes, yeah. um, which is much more of the documentary, indie documentary way of doing things. But because, because I had my eye on where, who I wanted to see this film and what kind of access and the accessibility I wanted it to have, um, it was clear to me that it needed to kind of really fit this conventional format. I'm not a huge fan of talking head documentaries, right? but with, an, with something that's about archival footage, I think that's really the only way to do it. Um, and so very early on, we wanted this, you know, this background that's just textures of white and really foregrounding the person speaking and letting you know, their presentation be the story and they're not looking behind them to see what their apartment looks like, like I'm doing right now. There's so many powerful and moving moments in the documentary. Which ones had the biggest sort of resonance with you when you were filming? In terms of the stories? Yeah, so which ones kind of stick out to you as being kind of, I guess, the most impactful, you know, when you're in the room at the time when you're filming them or when you watch it back? It's hard to say now that I've lived with, 
the, the cut for so long. Um, you know, there's, there's things that impacted me in different ways, sort of, you know, the, the history, academic nerd in me loves the way Susan Stryker connects um, the birth of cinema to these sort of social anxieties that we see around gender and race and mm -hmm. how those sort of, all those things sort of grow up together through cinema. Um, she, you know, she talks about the, the cut body that is in a film by the racist filmmaker D.W. Griffith, but he makes a film where apparently the invention of the cinematic cut um, happened for the first time, uh, meaning like cutting to make yeah. a, to further the narrative. I didn't really tell that story well, so you're gonna have to watch the documentary to understand that story better. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> um, but then, of course, Yancey Ford brings in, you know, how can we teach these things about D.W. Griffith without addressing the race and, and gender issues that D.W. Griffith does such a disservice to. Um, so I love that part. I love that, that the way that we were able to have these really nuanced conversations, all pointing back to the same thing, but talking about, you know, historical erasure and talking about how we're educating and who we're prioritizing and whose voices are getting centered. And I, I just love that with the slightest shift of the lens, Susan was able to center trans history. Yeah. And I think that's a really empowering and vital thing for trans people to witness. Um, obviously Jen's story, you know, at the end of the film where she's reacting to the father um, who, you know, is so in love with his child. Um, and she talks about how she had never seen someone look at their child that way. She's certainly never seen herself that way. Um, and it's a, it's a, it was a really moving moment on set like that. For a long time, I thought that would be the end of the film. Like that mm. just sums it up, right? But it, it wasn't quite the right ending I needed because I really wanted to bring the film back to actually visibility is not the goal, right? It's just a means to an end. So I thought having that, having the film end on that story would make it seem like all we need is visibility. But anyway, that was a really powerful moment um, and then Laverne has so many powerful moments. Um, I think when she talks about Nip Tuck and she, you really see her kind of settle into her seat and just question, you know, how, or is anybody thinking about the trans viewer when they were telling these stories, you know? So there were so many, so many moments on set that changed me. It's important to say too, that it's not just a case of being visible, but it's the right kind of visibility. Like there's so many examples of the wrong kind. So it's really important not to misrepresent people and have them tell their own stories and their own truths. Yeah. So I'm just putting that out there for whoever watches this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you look at this history, everything, like the majority of the work is so distorted and does such a disservice and all points back to a trans person not being who they say they are, right? All of these tropes, all of these stereotypes we see over and again. So any sort of representation that is saying a trans person isn't real it is not helpful. Exactly. And um, what do you consider to be the, the key moments and um, turning points of like in trans representation? Of course, recently we've had Oranges and New Black and Pose, which is phenomenal. Which ones sort of stand out for you over the years? You know, there's this episode in Queen Sugar uh, by Ava DuVernay, where it was when I first saw Brian Michael Smith. And for me, that was a turning point because of the way she told the story. Um, and you have to see it to understand. But I had never seen anyone deal with a trans character with that sort of care and nuance and sort of a flip in the power dynamic. It was just the antithesis of everything I'd seen up to that point. So the documentary is one hour, 47 minutes long. I've, I've heard that there's, there was an, an earlier cut that was about three hours. <laughs> Does that footage still exist? Can we see those deleted scenes? Might they be released on Blu-ray one day? I, I hope so. I, I have a dream that I want to take all the material that is so valuable, all the clips that didn't make it into the film, all the interviews that are so moving, and hire five different trans directors to tell like an episode, right? Maybe break it up into like five episodes and have a docu-series on it. That's what I, that's my dream. That's what I'm trying to make happen. I love that, that's so amazing. So I guess you've got, you must have tons of footage because every time you interviewed someone, they obviously would have said a lot more than there would ever be room to show. Yeah, I, I think my database ended up being about 600 television titles and about 400 film titles. 
Wow. So there's a lot. And I think we got about 200 into the film. So there's a lot. See, on my show, some of my interviews just run two, three hours long, so I just put the whole thing on mine. <laughs> 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 yeah, good I, idea. That would take a long time to edit. I'll just put it all online and then just go do something else. <laughs> <laughs> And so how important is it to have trans people telling their own stories? Because obviously you've seen people that are cisgender who have won Oscars for portraying trans people. But why is it so important for trans people to tell their own story? Trans people are the experts of their own history. They're the experts of their own lives. And to have someone talk about or for a trans person it otherizes them, like makes trans people seem like uh, an experiment or something to talk about uh, an object right like uh, that they're that we're not able to speak for ourselves um so in terms of that's like behind the camera trans people need to be telling their own stories um and also there's just a sensitivity that trans people have in telling trans stories that a person who doesn't have that experience just won't ever have access to that being said i would never want to live in a world where we're not allowed to tell stories beyond our experience Right. We still live at a time where the power dynamic is such that we need to prioritize trans storytellers and trans actors, not only um, because of employment opportunities, right, um, and also to correct the wrongs of the past and how non-trans people have told these stories, and to avoid some further violence that Jen has a really good argument in the film of talking about that when cis men are cast to play trans women, it furthers this idea that transness is simply a performance. It's just something you put on. And as soon as the camera turns off, you take off your wig, you take off your makeup, you take off your dress. And therefore you're really a man. And Jen talks about how in particular for straight men who are attracted to trans women, see them as women, it's a heterosexual dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, when they see these images on screen of men, of cis men playing trans women, they start to fear that if their friends find out they're in love with trans women, that'll somehow take away from their masculinity. Now, obviously that's a whole other issue that needs to be talked about. Homophobia is a problem, but it's, it's so, when we're placing these sort of homophobic fears on a trans woman's body, um, we often see her get killed. And there is a connection between the way film and television has told these stories because 80% of the population, at least in, in this country, in the United States, say they've never met a trans person, right? Or they don't think they've ever met a trans person and that right. the experience of trans people is only through film and TV that they see. And so it's a, that's where they're learning all their information about who we are. And it's important to say too that trans people don't carry signs around their neck saying, I am trans. They, they just go about their life and you know, so, um, I mean, I've been in London and I just have know quite a lot of trans people, but, you know, I'll go into a shop and see a trans person or just walking down the street and I'll be like, hi, it's amazing to see you. Um, but, you know, trans people just exist and get on with their lives. Yeah, I was talking to someone recently about sort of, you know, uh, one of the problems with trans storytelling is what we often see is everything that happens to that person is because they're trans, mm -hmm. right? So but it's like the world seems to forget that we also do our laundry, right? We also go food shopping. You know, yeah. I go to the farmer's market every Saturday and that has nothing to do with me being trans. <laughs> and so that's also something I want. I ask storytellers when they're like, really want to tell a trans story. I'm like, okay, well go through your script and show me where something happens that is not because that person's trans. And usually they can't, right? Because yeah. it's just seen as this, there's a lack of imagination when it comes to storytellers and they want to use trans bodies as a narrative device. That's not what we are, right? So. Now, Disclosure was, of course, released on June 19th, and I watched it the day it came out on Netflix. What's the reaction been like? Wow, it's been um, incredible. I, I, it's overwhelming, and I'm still taking it in. Um, it's, it's, I don't even know how to say. It's been great. Um, <laughs> Laverne, you know, has been hustling with press and doing a beautiful job and people really want to talk to her and, and talk to the cast. And there's just, people are saying that it's changing how they see the history of trans people, but it's also changing how they see themselves. Like there, there's an access point where this is not just about transness, this is about everyone's relationship to media. 
And that was really one of my hopes was that this was kind of like, a, this is a case study, right? This is a very important story and history to know, but it's also, this can be applied to so many ways that film and television tell stories about anyone who's not a white, cis, straight guy. <laughs> so um, it seems it's starting that conversation, which is really exciting, or furthering that conversation. I mean, obviously that conversation has been happening for a very long time. Um, but it's adding to that conversation, which is what I was hoping. And hopefully it will better inform people that are thinking about their programming in the future. And also for audiences, just to recognize the, these really tired, worn out tropes that they've been doing and wheeling out for decades. Hopefully demand more authenticity from their programming as well. And can you tell me what you're working on next? Um, not, I can't talk about it yet. <laughs> we won't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> to be announced soon. Exciting. Well, you're very welcome back on a future episode of the show, and I highly recommend everyone pauses this interview, then or continue the last little bit of it, and then go watch Disclosure. Tell all your family and your friends and your your colleagues to watch it too. It's such an important documentary. I really think everyone should watch it. Thank you so much. It was so nice talking with you. Me too. And finally, if you've got any messages for people watching the Sarah O'Connell show and your fans around the world? Watch the show. Watch all the shows. Go to the YouTube channel. Watch them all. They're great. I did. Thank you so much, Sam Fader. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on my show today. My pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody watching at home. Be sure to share, subscribe, give this video a big thumbs up and leave lots of lovely comments. And I'll see you all again soon for another episode of the Sarah O'Connell show. Bye.